Welcome to an Urban Conservative special news report here on Millennium TV 24. Thanks for watching on Roku TV, Apple TV, and Amazon TV. With the New York governor's race way under stakes right now, uh, stakes are high there. There's also a state legislature race. And Raheem, we've got a special guest with us today. Yeah, absolutely. And and I want to start the show off by, again, thanking you, the viewer, for taking the time to stay plugged in with us and everything that we're doing. We also want to thank the whole team over at Millennium 24 um, and all of our partners and sponsors that come along to help us to bring this wonderful content. Um, and like you mentioned, there's a there's a lot of uh, attention being given to the obviously the very contested New York gub gubernatorial race. Um, but they're, all of the races are important. And over here, we want to make sure um, that you know and, and are well informed about who's running and what they're running for. And today we're going to be be joined by a very special guest. We're, we're proud uh, to have this gentleman on the platform with us and to bring him to you and, and to let you, the viewer, you know, be informed about what our elected officials are doing and what our candidates intend to do. Um, so today we're going to be joined by uh, current New York State Senator for District 1, a friend of the show, uh, a stand-up guy, a gentleman we've had on our platform several times, and uh, we are joined by Senator Anthony Palumbo. Welcome to the show, sir. For having me. Absolutely. We appreciate you for coming on. Uh, there's a lot going on here in New York, and uh, you have a race go you have a race going on here. Um, but but first and foremost, let's talk about the elephant in the room. We want to get your thoughts on the recent debate between Lee Zeldin and Kathy Hochul. Uh, we noticed that Lee Zeldin does have a broad coalition. We've seen Democrats and independents come out and endorse Lee Zeldin. How well do you think that bodes for a red wave of sorts in New York in regards to the gubernatorial race? You know, that's a great question. When you think about the enrollment in New York, we have more than two to one Democrat to Republican enrollment. So you need literally hundreds of thousands, if not a, a million or so. There are six point, I believe, seven million registered Democrats and 2.3 Republican. So you need a few a millions of Democrats to vote for you if you plan on winning as a Republican. So that just goes to show you that, that his message, it, it's a broad stroke across all stripes of all political persuasions. Um, it, it's, it's something that I think it has resonated so significantly. This race shouldn't even be close. If Governor Hochul was doing even close to what her job is required, this would, no matter how great a candidate we have, you have the power of the incumbency. You've got all these other advantages being in office. And in a blue, blue state, deep blue state like New York, the fact that this race isn't even, it, it is, is, is close um, I think shows you that this state is in crisis. And quite frankly, it's so bad that, uh, I mean, Lee Zeldin is an amazing candidate. Um, he's got the right message. And I think he pulls it off in six days. I really do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, well I, Raul, I one thing. Really, go, go ahead. ahead. You first. Okay, well, real quick, I saw that you guys had Governor Ron DeSantis in New York campaigning um, for Lee Zeldin. And it was a, a funny part of that was he was saying that, uh, you know, Lee Zeldin may be putting a stop to all of this flight from New York down to Florida. Um, do you think that New York can be saved, number one? And what do you think you can do as a state senator going back into hopefully with a governor, Lee Zeldin in there? What are the, some of the things you think you need to be doing to get New York back on track? Well, sure. And and I think th there's no question New York can be saved um, because the reason why it is in its current state is a result of one party rule and their policies, period. We can turn it around. Um, as a state legislator, you know, I've had um, I was in the assembly for about seven years. I've been in the Senate now for two for one term. We run every two years um, and there's a lot that we can do. And I think really the most important aspect of it is dealing with the crime issue, dealing with the overspending. We don't have necessarily a, a revenue problem or a tax problem we, in, in the sense that we overspend. We had a, higher than expected revenues this past cycle and the governor spent it all. She didn't put it back in the taxpayer's pocket. Um, she didn't provide more funding to police and law enforcement to do their job. There was a the police movement, to, um, unfortunately, took hold in New York. Meanwhile, they implemented new discovery rules, many new legislative changes 
um, that the one party really was beating up on law enforcement and prosecutors. Um, and they spent millions and millions of dollars trying to keep up, yet they weren't given the additional funding. So the state can be saved, and I'm not going to give up. I've got a freshman in college and an 11th grader, so we need to continue that fight no matter what um, the situation is or no matter how far gone we think it is because I'm not giving up just yet. Um, we can do a lot. And I'm a ranking Republican on the codes committee. If we pick up 12 seats in the Senate, um, I'll be the chairman of the codes committee. And I'm on judiciary as well. Those two committees and really codes is anything with a penalty, all the criminal justice reforms go through the codes committee. So if I'm the chairman, I can control the criminal justice situation in this, in this state. And we can make some real big changes for the good to give us, uh, you know, back our sanity and safety. Absolutely. Well, I, I, I want to go back really quickly. Uh, Kathy Hochul's debate, the, the debate with Lee Zeldin, she she made light of why is it so important to Lee about the crime. And for people that think it's hyperbole or rhetoric or, or you know, just us as, uh, uh, you know, some of us as conservatives, is the crime real? Is this real? Or is this just hyperbole? Because she seems to dismiss it. And you, from the position that you're in, like you said, being a former prosecutor, uh, have you actually, is, is this a myth that the crime is on the rise? Or is she really that disconnected, in your opinion? Well, the stats are what they are, right? She said, and homicides have been down 4%, but they were up 30, you know, from the year before. You can't go with the year to year numbers. Did the pandemic have at least something to do with it? I would say possibly yes, of course. Mm -hmm. But these policies were implemented and the the even the larceny related from crimes, grand larceny, it's up something like 700 percent from pre-pandemic levels, because right at the pandemic, these these policies took effect in January of 2020. And the pandemic was a month and a half later. So that's why it's it, it, it's. It, it's a great way for them to try and deflect when you say it's not anecdotal stories or it's not, it's just all hyperbole Republicans fear mongering. Just look at the Comstat numbers. You have actually Mayor Adams went up to Albany asking for some big changes. Um, he's someone who's truly a, a progressive Democrat. We have David Soares, the Albany DA, who's a very partisan Democrat. He dismissed the case against Andrew Cuomo after the sheriff charged him. Um, because I think he was more afraid of him, but didn't want to tarnish um, his name because he thought it would be a tough case. So he's called for reforms to the bail reform, to the discovery reform. He's called reforms to all the changes in the criminal justice system. Um, and he's not being partisan. He's not looking to uh, obviously grandstand. He knows the truth, as do we. So the only way you can avoid it when you're to blame like Governor Kathy Hochul and the two majorities, um, that the, the Democrats that have had one party rule, the only way that they can actually sound like they care is to say, oh, there's another reason, or you're wrong, you're a liar, and just conflate all of those issues um, when that's really not the case, when we know the truth. And quite frankly, the bottom line is New Yorkers don't feel safe. So whether, whether it is hyperbole or not, they do not feel safe, and they know that the party of law enforcement, the party that can handle crime, that's willing to do what it takes in a fair and balanced way, but willing to prosecute the bad guy, that's the Republican Party. So hopefully um, on November 8th, they'll certainly let their voices be heard. Well, one thing real quick, Brian, I I'm going to share this with you, Mr. Palumbo. A couple of weeks back, a month or two back, my brother made a trip down here to North Carolina and I said, look, man, you know, the flights are a couple of dollars cheaper to fly out of JFK. And he absolutely refused, refused to go into New York City with his, with my nephew, with my 10 year old nephew. And I think that speaks leaps and bounds of the need to make sure we have pro law enforcement candidates. We have people that are going to support our officers, our first responders and keep New Yorkers safe. So, yeah, right. I, I just thought I would share well, that. Well, one more, one, yeah, no, one, one more quick question before we take this break. We got about uh, three minutes before the break. Right. Um, when we talk about bail reform and I'm glad you brought that up, Senator Palumbo. 
when we if we get these seats that we need here in New York, what can we immediately do? Because I know people want to know what can what are Republicans and what can we do to get these bail reform laws reversed in the, in the short term with the majority uh, or with with some more seats in the New York State Senate? How, how what do we do to reverse this terrible thing called bail reform? Well, you know, the new governor um, could ultimately issue an executive order declaring Oh, he could declare that there is a state of emergency, which is the crime crisis, and then by executive order suspend it. Um, but the governor's power is in the budget. And I know we only have about two minutes to go. I'll try and make it as quick as, as possible. But in the, there, there were many lawsuits with Governor Pucky where he would put legislative issues in the budget. It doesn't have to do the, think about this. Bail reform was in the budget because the governor had leverage then and controls everything when it comes to the budget. As a standalone bill, you don't have that leverage because you still you can't force anybody to try and get it done. So bottom line is uh, um, the governor can put all kinds of ads and legislation in that budget, and the budget's due April 1st. So we could clean that up very, very quickly. And I, I'll just say this as well. As a former prosecutor, Nobody wants anyone to jail for two years on five dollars bail waiting for their trial. That's not what bail's intended. Sure, you're returning to court. And it's not intended to punish people for being poor. But then again, when you have a blanket policy, zero discretion with the judges, and you mandate that everyone must be released um, and let you just open the doors and let everyone run free, then that clearly isn't the answer either, letting it, letting the babies out with the bathwater, so to speak. Um, as I sit here today, if they sell less than two ounces of fentanyl, which is a ton of fentanyl, could kill probably a few hundred people, I must be released from jail in New York State. Not may, must. A judge cannot hold me on a Class A2 drug sale, not even a possession. So an actual drug dealer selling a lot of drugs Unless you're an A1, the highest level over two ounces, the judge must let you go, deeming that because they said, well, it's a nonviolent, it's, it, it's absolutely a nonviolent charge. Well, it is under our penal law, but there's a lot of violence surrounding drug dealing and death and destruction. So unfortunately, I disagree with that. And those people need to unfortunately build um, pending trial. And it won't be on $500 bail. It'll be on $500 bail. Well, ladies man. and gentlemen, we are talking to Senator Anthony Palumbo, who is running for New York State Senate a di Assembly Dis si Senate <laughs> District 1. You are watching an Urban Conservative Special Report here on Millennium News TV 24. We'll be right back. Millennium TV, bridging communities worldwide. We broadcast diverse international content from Europe, Asia, Africa, and now right here in the USA. Watch us via Roku on your smart TV. Submit your own content to 1530entertainmentllc at gmail.com. Download the Millennium TV app from the App Store to stream our shows anywhere, anytime. Millennium TV. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to an Urban Conservative News Special Report. Once again, we are joined by New York State Senator Anthony Palumbo. I, I didn't want us to cut that last thought short, Senator Palumbo, because... You've been involved with with uh, uh, the 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 death the death by dealer bill. I want to call it if I'm naming it the right way, if I'm wording it the right way. How has this border crisis and people think there's a disconnect between the border crisis and these deaths bodies, fentanyl, and all of these different things? Can you connect those two dots for the voters and for the people that are watching so they can understand how this is coming into our state in New York and how it's affecting our young people here? Absolutely. Absolutely. And unfortunately, Suffolk County was um, only a few years ago, the number one state regarding opioid deaths and overdoses. Um, so that's that's something that is of, of very serious concern. And we have an opioid crisis just generally, um, I think, in the entire country without having an open border. And now we have more fentanyl seized I believe it was around June or July, there was more fentanyl seized at the border than they did in the previous three or four years combined. It was some sort of an unbelievable amount that they've recovered. 
And um, of course, there are hundreds of thousands of gotaways. So um, that's a, a real serious concern that drugs are pouring over the board. Everyone was suffering during the pandemic. There's a very significant amount of uh, mental health going on and abuse and use of, of drugs and alcohol. And most importantly, um, fentanyl laced drugs. We had out in my district, some, uh, a group of individuals in one weekend, nine overdosed, six died from cocaine laced with fentanyl. It's a cheap alternative. They can cut it with talcum powder or a number of other drugs. Um, and it's a hundred times stronger than, than heroin. So wow. the, the, this is something that must be addressed, not may. I mean, this is as I'm talking about, you know, the, these discretionary things. The, we have a new DA, thank goodness, in Suffolk County, who is a career prosecutor, who's a professional prosecutor, Ray Tierney. Um, he, I, he and I were office mates when I was a prosecutor. Actually, we were friends. Um, I knew him back then. He went to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, handled many, many, you know, conspiracies to commit murder and um, tried many, many cases against uh, gang members, drug lords, went um, into the into back into the state system. And right before he ran for D.A. in Suffolk, he was the number three guy in the Brooklyn D.A.'s office. And he's a Republican. So he was working for a very progressive D.A. Gonzalez. But he it has nothing to do with politics when you're a pro. Um, and fortunately, he's the guy we have now who has the resources and uh, the brains to do what we can to really fight that fight. Um, his number two guy is a, is a, is a federal, former federal prosecutor as well. So it's a collaborative process. There, it, immigration's a federal issue, but everybody's on board with fighting that fight. That, that, that fentanyl and, and drug issue um, is pervasive, and it affects people of all walks of life, rich people, poor people. Um, and I, I explained to my kids, you may remember during the presidential election 2016, Carly Fiorina, she was the, the CEO of Hewlett Packard. Yep. Woman made around $40 million a year, was a very, very wealthy person, and she lost a son to opioid overdose. So it affects everybody, regardless of, you know, race, color, creed, financial situation, whatever it may be. Um, so that that's at critical mass, and we need to stay focused on that. And as a legislature, we need to keep putting money in the, into the hands of those people who can do that job. Well, one thing I want to do, I want to switch gears real quick to, uh, to another race that's happening in New York. Uh, some people may have had an opportunity to watch on the Urban Conservative, what I'm going to call the shellacking of Schumer. <laughs> um, that was, I'm just curious, what was your take on the Joe Pinion, Chuck Schumer debate? And um, what, again, if anything, did you take away from that debate uh, as far as Chuck and Joe went? Well, you know, I mean, Joe's a great candidate, a great guy, really smart guy. I mean, he really showed his chops um, at that debate. And I think he's an amazing candidate. And I'm really hopeful that he can, uh, you know, climb that mountain. Chuck Schumer is, is someone who has been a shameless politician his entire adult life. Um, you know, you see him and, you know, he, he's, he's, uh, he's got the rhetoric down pretty good. Um, I think Joe really pinned him down a few times, but unfortunately, you know, Chuck Schumer is, is Chuck Schumer. He he'll say just pretty much whatever he needs to say to stay in power. And someone like him, you know, he's been able as the, as the current majority leader to bring a lot of money back to New York and say the right things. Um, so we're really rooting for that, for that red wave. And Joe would be amazing representing us down in Washington. Um, you know, but it, it's an 800 pound gorilla. Chuck Schumer is a tough nut to crack because he doesn't have a lot of these policies that are driving. I think the governor's race, they're not hanging on the shoulders of Chuck Schumer. He can keep his distance and he's been smart enough to stay away. You know, he wasn't saying things like defund the police and all these other things that uh, many other people on the state level were. Um, but I like Joe a lot. He's a super nice guy, too. Excellent. I was just curious your take on that because we watched it here. And I'm telling you, at every few seconds, we were both like, ah, who? Oh, yes. right, right, right. Yeah, he well, landed well, some punches. He did a good job. Sp speaking of debates, uh, I had the pleasure of an attending a debate that you did uh, with the with the gentleman that's 
uh, running against you. I, I can't, unfortunately, remember his name. I'm no disrespect, but I can't even remember his name. Um, I, I have to commend you on the way you conducted yourself during that debate uh, because it seems to me, and it's just my opinion, it seems to me that there's a lack, and maybe you've sensed this, that some of the things coming from, from one side of this don't seem very uh, uh, well thought out. Some of the ideas that are being presented aren't well thought out. And this being your first term as a senator, just talk a little bit about how you've been able to get things done and some of the things that you've been able to accomplish up until this point, because it's a tall task. And I don't think people are considering the people that they're considering for these positions. And I, I noticed that with the young man that's run out, but, but just talk a little bit about what you've been able to accomplish in this up until this point and uh, what you intend to accomplish moving forward. Well, you know, and I appreciate that. And thank you for the compliment, you know, and that's how you, you run a race against an incumbent. You need to just attack them. That's unfortunately the formula. So they try to make you out to be some kind of a monster. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, in my first term in the Senate, I passed 37 bills. Um, that's more than a lot of majority members. Just for some perspective, um, you know, AOC has passed zero in her career. Zero bills. So, you know, she's great on the television and can, you know, get the media to track and follow her. And she's the darling of their, uh, you know, of their day. But um, it takes work to get it done. And being in the Republican minority, um, you know, it's all it's even more work. And I was in the assembly, as I said. So I do have relationships with many people on the other side. Um, and we got we were able to get a lot done, you know, and we've got, um, for example, an affordable housing bill that's on for referendum. Um, in four of the five eastern towns. Um, that's something that's that's seriously needed on Long Island and generally on the East End. Um, you know, that, that's something I'm very, I'm proud of that bill because that will make a difference, I believe, um, for our workforce housing and for, um, you know, just our next generation to live out East. Um, you know, we've had, we've had many, many local issues, many local policies, a lot of environmental policy, um, a kelp bill expanding that industry, um, which is essentially a seaweed, but it, it, it is an actual crop. And, um, you know, that's going to be great for our aquaculture industry. Um, going forward, I think our primary focus, and that's why I think it's so critical, this election on November 8th, because when we talk about saving our state, you know, and, and uh, Congressman Zeldin's phrase has been losing is not an option, because we are the least friendly business state in the country. We are the highest taxed state in the country. When does it, when does it give? When is there going to be, when are we going to hit that, get to the top of the mountain where maybe the pendulum goes the other way, where maybe we start going downhill and giving some relief to our residents? Because the gap is separating. We're getting, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poor, and the middle class is leaving. We lost a congressional seat in this last cycle, um, we've lost over a million residents. We had the largest out migration of any big city. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, Governor DeSantis, uh, you know, we were chatting and, and he's, you know, they had about 600,000 less Democrats than Republicans when he took office. It's completely flipped now. A 1.2 million net change in uh, in, in registration of Republicans in Florida, and they have a huge influx. Their housing market is booming and a huge influx of people moving down there. Um, so it's not, as Governor Cuomo said, that, uh, you know, it's not the weather. We had the greatest, and th th what's upset about you, what upsets me about you saying you, you won't even want to go into the city like most of us. This was, this is still and can be the greatest city that it was on the planet, New York City is an amazing place, art, culture, diversity. It's an amazing place. It was the safest big city in the world. And now we have the New York City that we see today. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot that can be done. And I know that I'm giving a long answer, but I, everyone needs to understand the perspective of, we gotta get to work. We have to reduce regulations on business. We need to stop with the spending. I took office a little under 10 years ago the budget was, I think, around $145 billion with a B. 
Mm. Last year, it was $225 billion, with a B. Think about that. Our budget is more than Florida's and Texas combined. And they both have more people than us. So we tax the heck out of our residents and spend, 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 spend. And now the dike is about to break open because people are leaving. And that's really the biggest crisis because as people leave, our revenues start to shrink. And then all hell breaks loose. I like what uh, I like what DeSantis said. I I was listening to the interview earlier and he said, tax lightly, spend wisely. I love that. Absolutely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, again, we're talking with Senator Anthony Palumbo. If you're just tuning in again, we want to thank everybody that supports the platform. We want to continue to bring you uh, interviews like this with people. Um, that are, are in the know, all right, because it's one thing to hear things on the, the mainstream, what we call the lamestream media, but it's another thing to actually hear from the people that are in a position to tell you what, what's actually going on. So we appreciate that. We're going to take a quick one minute break and we'll be right back. You're watching the Urban Conservative Special News Report here on Millennium TV 24. Stay tuned. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Urban Conservative News Special Report here on Millennium TV 24. Millennium TV, bridging communities worldwide. We broadcast diverse international content from Europe, Asia, Africa, and now right here in the USA. Watch us via Roku on your smart TV. Submit your own content to 1530entertainmentllc at gmail.com. Download the Millennium TV app from the App Store to stream our shows anywhere, anytime. Millennium TV. So here on the tail end of things, Senator Palumbo, um, we have a race here in a few, what, what do we got, about eight days, something like six that? Six days. Six days? Seven six six six. days? Out. Uh, in this last, if you haven't early voted, what is your message to the voters and and? Uh, because I, I really feel like the the left and particularly this in, the, this being an issue made of abortion and these other issues that are really I don't want to say non issues, but I feel like they're smoke screens because mm-hmm. there's a group that don't want to talk about the economy. They don't want to talk about the crime and they don't want to talk about, you know, some of the work that you guys have been doing. So. Uh, in this last few days here, what's your message to the voters um, and to the voters in your district and, and to people who see this around the country? Sure. And, and you're exactly right that these folks do not want to address the kitchen table issues. They want to talk about Donald Trump and have a news flash. Donald Trump is not the president. Donald Trump is not on the ballot. Um, and the other issues, which are important issues, the abortion issue is an important issue to many folks. We had a Republican Senate for 47 of 50 years, just a few years ago. All all those years with a Republican governor, nothing happened to it in New York. It's not going anywhere. Um, And I think what voters really need to consider as they go to the ballot box is what is good government about? It has to do, in my opinion, with a diversity of thought. Every stakeholder in in and on an issue in any situation should have their voice heard. And that creates a balance that is necessary. When you don't have balance and you have one group driving the bus, like we see on the federal level, they want to spend, 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 and look what's happening to our economy. We're not energy independent. Now we're, we've got all these other major, huge issues that aren't being addressed because everyone's kind of pushing in one direction. When you have the other side's voice heard, that creates compromise and that's good for everyone. And in New York, We've had that, unfortunately. We've had one party rule since 2019, January 1, 2019. In just, what, three and a half years? Look what's happened. And nothing was implemented until 2020. It's really in about two years. The wheels came off of this place. Um, And that's because there's no balance. So we need that balance back in Albany. And it was a long way. The assembly, I don't think it's possible for them to get a majority it's a really tough road to hoe for us in the Senate. There is a road to 32 out of 63 members, but it's really tight. Um, and most importantly, that governor's race is what will bring that balance. So even if we have a slight majority in the Senate, the assembly will remain Democrat. We need a governor who can right the ship and start focusing on the policies that are important to New Yorkers and the policies that affect their pocketbook. 
because that's the most critical aspect of life, living in an expensive state in the Northeast. Absolutely. I, I have to ask this quick question before we go to, because there's this myth that uh, politicians are on the right, uh, particularly Republicans, are trying to get rid of Social Security and do away with it. Is there any truth to that? Have you heard this? Is it to your the best of your knowledge are the Republicans trying to get rid of Social Security and leave the elderly and those, you know, that are on this program with nothing? Is this true? Could you imagine if that were? Of course not. And, you know, and they talk about, well, we want smaller government. And I'm a less government is, is more guy. But if you want to take one little cent, red cent from someone who's retired, you're not going to do it over my dead body. Be, uh, you, oh, you'll only do it over my dead body. Right. You're not going to do that to these folks because they aren't they can't get back in the workforce. They struggled and saved and did what they had to do and worked their whole life to be where they are. So that is absolutely not an option. And I think that's just the only other issue that they can try and lob out there to try and scare people to vote for them. Um, and think about it. What politician in their right mind would do that? Because you'd immediately be thrown out of office. You'd be nuts to do it, even if you felt you wanted to do that in your heart. So um, that's something that is just bananas. I can't imagine someone would actually honestly want to do that. Um, and I will, I will not on my watch. Will that happen? If, if, if I have any say in it, that's insane. Absolutely. Well, so real quick, Ra, I got a, I got a question. I, I just want to go back to something real quick. Um, we here in North Carolina have somebody that I call governor, uh, Vito, uh, Cooperoni because he vetoes everything. Roy Cooper's like the king of the veto here. Um, how important is it for New Yorkers um, for uh, presumptive Governor Zeldin to have that veto power there and stop some of the Democrat madness? Well, exactly. And, and the beauty of it is, you know, having been there now for a while, is a governor who's smart about these things can say, I tell you what, I will pass your law, but I want you to change it in X, Y and Z fashion that we can do it. But the compromise are these few things. We call it a chapter amendment and they sign it. They either say, I'm going to veto it unless you change it. And that's the beautiful thing is that actually right now there's a supermajority of Democrats in the Senate and a supermajority of Democrats in the assembly. They could override the governor. So I believe we're going to pick up plenty of seats, at least in the Senate, so that we can at least be um, that we won't be veto proof. Um, but, you know, that's that's the most important aspect of it is, again, even if you just if you have two Democrat majorities in the legislature and a governor of a different party can say or just a different mindset than just going along to get along with all these New York City ideals. They think about the suburbs, say, you know what, you can tweak this in this fashion. And at that point, I'll sign it and it'll become law and everybody's happy. Excellent. Go ahead, Ali. You got another question? No, that that's the one that I had because I was just been I was thinking about that. And mm -hmm. as much as Roy Cooper has vetoed here in North Carolina and, you know, we're fighting here for uh, Republican veto proof majorities, we need to pick up a few in our uh, legislature. So I feel you guys is struggle and pain up there in New York a whole lot. <laughs> Absolutely. Personally. So, so listen, in closing here again, uh, last message out to the voters uh, before election day here, uh, give them, give them the, give them the old uh, one, two, as it were, you know, uh, just the last few words for the voters going into this election. Sure. Absolutely. And I just want to thank you guys for having me. Um, I love being on your show. The beauty of it is it, it too, we have a podcast. I can do it from the comfort of my den in a sweater. Um, but uh, the last, the last, the parting words for the next six, six days are please vote. Your voice is important, really regardless of who you vote for. Because when we have people in office, when there's a low turnout and you have a small group of the constituency deciding who's who the ruling class is, that's not good. So we need to get have our voices heard. And quite frankly, and I've said it several times tonight, we need to make sure that there is balance in Albany, like there should be in every other uh, legislature and in every other situation, quite frankly. We need to have folks who um, clearly can, can reach across the aisle, but have some sort of adult conversations to try and work out the kinks and make some legislation that's good for everyone not just a very select con uh, con constituency, 
um, and primarily, unfortunately, they're all New York City ideals. They've been driving the bus. We need to have some balance. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, again, you have been watching an Urban Conservative News special report here on Millennium TV 24. Please stay tuned. Watch us on Roku, Amazon, and Apple TV. We appreciate you guys for tuning in. Please do us a favor. Stay safe. Make sure you get out and vote. Until next time, for my twin brother, Dual Ali, I'm Raheem Soto. Thank you guys so much for watching.